Okay, hi everyone, welcome. Um, those who don't know me, I'm Dion Levine. I am a gastroenterologist in Cape Town and Hruliskia. And welcome everyone. The G Echo is hosted by the Gastro Foundation in association with the Project Echo, University of New Mexico. And it's run every second Monday at six o'clock. And um, we'll take a few questions after the presentation. And Dr. Omar will give us a talk on refeeding syndrome and we'll discuss it. It's not nutrition and refeeding syndrome. That topic is just a massive topic. So we decided just to focus on refeeding syndrome. So if you wanna get started, we can crack on. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much, Dr. Dion Levine, for the kind introduction. Let me share my screen. So everyone can see my slides and you can hear me clearly. Yes, we can. Thank you, Karen. So this topic was done in the last session of DECO, I think two years ago. And my colleague concentrated more on general introduction of nutrition. And we've decided this time, most of our talk will be focused on refeeding syndrome. I'll have a very few introductions about nutrition, but most of the talk will be about refeeding syndrome. So this slide was adapted from International Food Policy Research Institute that was published in around 2016 and 2017. As you can see that it's estimated around 155 million children worldwide have child stenting and around 52 million children have child wasting. So that's the aspect of malnutrition. On the other hand, there is estimated around 2 billion adults are overweight and obese. They have at least a BMI of more than 25. This increases the risk of inflammatory diseases, diabetes, heart diseases, and malignancy. And it's also estimated that one in 12 people worldwide has diabetes. When it comes to gastroenterology, these people also have an increased risk of muscle D, gastroesophageal reflux disease. There is also another 2 billion people that are affected by micronutrient deficiency also. So what do we mean micronutrient deficiencies? Micronutrient deficiency is a lack of essential vitamins and minerals required in small amounts by the body for proper growth and development. And the most common ones are iron, vitamin A deficiency, iodine, zinc, and folate. So what are the common chronic diseases associated with micronutrient deficiencies. Those are thyroid diseases, cardiovascular diseases, again, type two diabetes, different types of malignancies, osteoporosis, depression, and a cognitive impairment. So whenever we admit a patient, it's better to do a nutritional assessment in terms of history and clinical examination. Why is that important? Because it has been studied that nutritional deficiencies will lead to increased hospital stay, increased complication rates, and at the same time, also ICU admissions and increase in ICU admission days because of nutritional deficiencies. So we need to do a general clinical assessment for patients. In the history, it comes out as an unintentional weight loss of more than 10% in the last three months increases risk of refeeding syndrome. You need to check a baseline function or a deterioration of function prior to admission, body composition, and a muscle mass strength. This can be estimated by using different imaging modalities like CT scan or an ultrasound. Obese patients can have nutritional deficiencies. And also 
don't forget about malnutrition patients, comorbidities, the ones we have talking about, and we need to check also, assess for the function of the gut. Patients with malabsorption syndromes also have an increased deficiencies. So refeeding syndrome. Refeeding syndrome was first observed and described during World War II. It has been observed in prisoners of war, concentration camp survivors, and victims of famine. What happened was that when these people have been given nutrition repletion, unexpected morbidity and mortality happened. It has been estimated that around 14,000 people died from Japanese prisoners of war because of heart failure, peripheral edema, neurological disorders, and they have seen that one out of five died within the next few days when they were given nutrition. So the only study I could find that has been done for refeeding syndrome was a study called Minnesota Starvation Experiment that was done at University of Minnesota in 1944. The study contained around 36 healthy individuals and what they wanted to do is to determine the physiological effects of severe and prolonged dietary restriction and the effectiveness of dietary rehabilitation strategies. It had four phases. Two of them was the starvation period and two recovery phases. What they observed that these patients, when they were starved, when they had a prolonged starvation, they have observed that they had severe emotional distress, depression, social withdrawal, impaired concentrations, decreased in metabolic rate, respiratory rate and heart rate, and they also developed edema in their extremities. So what is the definition of refeeding syndrome? According to the Aspen Consensus Recommendations for Refeeding Syndrome that was published in 2020, refeeding syndrome is a set of metabolic and electrolyte alterations occurring due to reintroduction of calories. It can be either through oral, enteral, and parenteral nutrition after a period of consistent reduction of energy intake or starvation in individuals with pre-existent malnutrition and or in catabolic state. So what they have noticed that the hallmark is hypophosphatemia, hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia, and thiamine deficiency. Those patients have higher risk of developing refeeding syndrome. So they classified into mild, moderate, and severe. So if you have one deficiency, either one or two or all of three of either serum phosphorus, potassium, and magnesium levels by 10 to 20% that occurs within five days of a reintroduction of calories, that's mild. Moderate is the same number of them, a decrease by 20 to 30%, and more than 30% or an organ dysfunction or due to time in deficiency that's considered severe. So the incidence, there is a lot of variabilities in the incidence of refeeding syndrome. Critically ill patients, there is a 34% chance of hypophosphatemia that can occur if nutrition is withheld for 48 hours. And severe hypophosphatemia has a mortality rate of 18.2% compared to 4.6 in those without hypophosphatemia. And different studies that have studied about the incidence of Refini syndrome had a variability of incidence between 0.43 up to 18% in all hospitalized patients. I found one local study that was done in South Africa, about 200 ICU surgical wards they found that around 12.5% was the incidence of refeeding syndrome. And out of the 200 patients, 146 patients needed electrolyte replacement. So who are the population at risk? So these are the main ones that are at risk. 
patients with eating disorders, anorexia nervosa, patients with mental health disorders, alcohol and substance use disorders, patients with malabsorption disorders, patients who have a prolonged starvation due to famine or in protest, child abuse and starvation, military recruits, athletes, chronic renal failure patients, and the critically ill patients. Don't forget that patients with overweight can be at risk also for feeding syndrome. They can have a micronutrient deficiencies also and electrolyte. So I want to discuss a little bit about the pathophysiology of refeeding syndrome. So during starvation, in the first 48 hours, the body uses the glycogen that has been stored. So the glycogen stores has been utilized and the body only uses glucose. So after 48 hours, what happens is that there is a decrease in in insulin production and increase in glucagon secretion, which will lead to mobilization of fat, free fatty acids, and protein catabolism, which will lead to gluconeogenesis. So the body uses it, free fatty acids and protein as an energy of source. So this will lead to protein, fat, mineral, and electrolyte depletion, vitamin depletion also. So when, when refeeding happens, when the patients are fed after a prolonged starvation, most probably after 10 days, what happens is that the body will revert into glucose metabolism and will use carbohydrates as the main source of energy. It will go into anabolic state. This will lead to increased secretion, increase in protein synthesis, glycogen synthesis, and increase in glucose uptake. This will lead to uptake of electrolytes like potassium, magnesium, phosphate, and the utilization of thiamine. And then you will have hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia, hypophosphatemia, and thiamine deficiency, and salt and water retention, which will lead to refeeding syndrome. This next slide shows what happens at the molecular level. So carbohydrate results in increase in insulin secretion, which will lead to extracellular movement of glucose into the cell. Phosphate and potassium follows and moves it in within the cell. That's one way of developing hypokalemia and hypophosphatemia. Phosphate also is required for ATP synthesis, protein synthesis, as well as direct phosphorylation of glucose. Thiamine is used as a cofactor for carbohydrate metabolism. Magnesium is also essential for many cellular processes involving ATB production. Again, also insulin will lead to reactivation of sodium and potassium pump, which will lead to potassium going into the cell, sodium will be exchanged and magnesium is used in this process. In the, and, and energy is used in this process. This will lead to sodium and water retention, which will lead to the edema and refeeding syndrome. So who are at risk for developing refeeding syndrome? So it can be divided into moderate risk and significant risk. Moderate risk, you only need two criteria for the patient to be at risk of developing refeeding syndrome. Significant risk, you only need one criteria. So the first one is the BMI. A BMI between 16 and 18.5, that's a moderate risk. A BMI less than 16 kilogram per meter square, that's a very high risk. Weight loss, around 5% in the last one month is a moderate risk. 
7.5% of weight loss in the last three months or more than 10% in the last six months, that's a significant risk. Caloric intake, none or negligible oral intake for the past five to six days or less than 75% of estimated energy requirement for more than seven days during an acute illness on, or injury or less than 75% of estimated energy requirement for more than one month. That's a moderate risk. The significant risk equivalent to that, the change is the date. This one is more than seven days. And the reduction of energy requirement is less than 50%. It's also very important that loss of subcutaneous fat or loss of muscle mass. If there is evidence of moderate or mild to moderate is a moderate risk. Evidence of severe loss is, a, is significant risk. Also comorbidities that we discussed about malignancy, chronic kidney disease, diabetes, if there is more than one, it puts the patient at significant risk. This slide, I took it from NICE guidelines. They divided into major risk factors A and B, and then very high risk factors of C. You only need one risk factor A for a minor risk. High risk, you need to have at least two risk factor A, or one risk factor B, and a very high risk, you only need one risk factor for C. So they divided it, it's just the different classifications you can use whichever you want, either this one or the other one. The difference, there is a slight difference between the BMI, very high risk, they put the BMI less than 14 kilogram, and the weight loss, they increase to more than 20%. And they've added starvation dates. One is five days for minor risk factors, more than 10 days for a major risk factor B, and a more than 15 days for a very high risk factors. So what are the clinical consequences when patients develop Rufinus syndrome? So they can have cardiac, respiratory, or neuromuscular clinical consequences. So hypophosphatemia is the most dangerous one out of the four. So they can have altered myocardial function, arrhythmias and congestive heart failure, acute respiratory failure, and also they can develop seizures, confusion, coma, paralysis, and rhabdomyolysis. Potassium, we all know the, uh, the consequences to lead to hypokalemia, which is arrhythmias, cardiac arrest, respiratory distress, paralysis, weaknesses. Magnesium also causes arrhythmias and tachycardia, ataxia, confusion, so thiamine deficiency can lead to wernicke korsakoff syndrome and a muscle weakness. And also in the cardiac, it can cause congestive heart failure. This is also a long list of the causes of these electrolyte abnormalities. The extra here is that sodium retention, which can lead to fluid overload and pulmonary edema. So I won't go through the whole list. So how do we approach these patients? So, Initiating caloric intake in the feeding syndrome. When patients, we need to, first of all, prevention is better than treatment. We need to have a high suspicion of patients who are at risk with the feeding syndrome. So depending on the risk factor, if the patient is mild risk or moderate risk or severe risk, we initiate caloric intake with 100 to 150 gram of dextrose or 10 to 20 kilo calorie per kg for the first 24 hours. If the patients are significant risk for feeding syndrome, we can start as low as five kilocalorie per kg for the first 24 hours. And we advance slowly by 33% of goal every one to two days. In moderate to high risk of feeding syndrome with low electrolyte levels, holding or initiating holding the initiation of calorie or increase of calories can be done until electrolytes are supplemented or normalized. We need to, we need to use caution when infusing IV dextrose constituted medications in cases 
with moderate to severe risk for refilling syndrome. There is no recommendations regarding fluid, sodium, and protein restriction. So this one contains enteral feeding as well as parenteral feeding. Electrolyte management in refeeding syndrome. We need to check serum potassium, magnesium, and phosphate before initiation of nutrition. We need to monitor them every 12 hours for the first three days in high-risk patients. And we need to replace if patients have low electrolytes. If the patients have very low electrolytes, we can delay initiation of nutrition. If electrolytes become difficult to correct or they drop, we can decrease the calorie or the grams of dextrose by 50% and advance by approximately 3% for every one or two days based on the clinical presentation. And we can actually stop the nutritional support when electrolyte levels are very life-threatening, low, or they are dropping continuously. So this is a summary of how we can replace the electrolytes if the patients have mild deficiency, moderate deficiency, or severe deficiency. So for example, if we take potassium between 3.1 to 3.5 millimoles, that's a mild deficiency. So we can actually use oral replacements or we can use IV replacements. If it's a moderate deficiency, which is between 2.5 to 3 millimoles, we have to use IV replacement. And severe deficiency definitely is IV. It's less than 2.5. Magnesium, it can be only divided into mild to moderate or severe. So between 0 0.5 to 0 0.7, that's mild to moderate. We can use oral replacements. If it's less than 0 0.5, then IV replacement is recommended. And we have to reassess every eight to 12 hours. Phosphate is the most one that's associated with high mortality. Also, again, it's divided into mild, moderate, and severe deficiency, okay? So thiamine supplementation of the feeding syndrome. So we need to supplement thiamine, 100 milligram, before feeding or before initiating dextrose containing IV fluids in patients who are at risk. And we have to supplement thiamine for at least five to seven days or longer in patients with severe starvation, chronic alcoholism, or other high risk of deficiency and signs of thiamine deficiency. And if patients develop Wernicke's Corsica syndrome, the dosage is higher. For Wernicke's acute treatment, we can give thiamine IV 500 milligram twice daily or three times daily for 72 hours, then we reassess. Corsica, also same thing, the same dosage, and then we can treat for up to three to 12 months. So this slide summarizes approach of refeeding syndrome. Number one, we assess patients who are at risk. We need to have a high index of suspicion. Number two, we check the serum potassium, phosphate, and magnesium, and we correct them if they are low. Before feeding and administer thiamine and other vitamin supplements, maintain supplementation for at least 10 days. If patients are extremely high risk, as I mentioned, we can start as low as five kilocalorie per kg per day. We need to have a continuous cardiac monitoring. If it's high risk, we can start as 10 kilocalorie and moderate risk, we can give them 50% of energy needed in the first 48 hours. We need to monitor fluid balance, blood pressure, heart rate and glycemia regularly. We need to monitor serum electrolytes closely until patient blood results are stable. And at the end of the day, we need to have a multidisciplinary nutritional support team. We need to involve the nutritionists in the hospital. So for conclusion, the fitness syndrome is a very fatal disorder that can happen for patients who are at risk. We need to have a multidisciplinary team approach. We need to identify patients at risk early. We need to anticipate complications and prevent them. We need to correct electrolytes and thiamine. 
supplementation. Thank you. Thanks very much. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, okay. Thanks a lot. That's a very nice overview. Um, before we put it out for questions, just to highlight a few things that you mentioned. I think you must remember that refeeding syndrome can happen whether it's TPN or nasogastric or nasogestional feeding. So it's not a concept that is only unique to parenteral nutrition, which is the point you made that I want to highlight. The second thing is just in terms of the pre-assessment of your magnesium, phosphate, et cetera, that you've mentioned, just to say that albumin is a very poor marker of nutritional assessment, just as a general comment. And I thought I would mention that now. Patients with anorexia have normal albumins. Patients who've come in with high output stomas, who've been neglected and haven't uh, had any nutrition for 10 days, have normal albumins unless there's something else going on that's driving your albumin down. So you can't look at the albumin and say, well, the albumin's fine, they're not going to have refeeding. Then just in terms of the risk to follow, in terms of the risk, patient risks, a high output stoma or patients who've had bypass procedures, especially for obesity surgery, and who run into trouble for whatever reason, um, are at risk of having refeeding once you've started their, their, their feeding uh, uh, again. And then in terms of initiating the refeeding program. In, uh, what I mean by that is the nutritional refeeding. I think I want to highlight the point you make that you just go slowly. There's no rush to feed the patient. You know, they will die from a refeeding syndrome, and we've seen this happen sooner than they will die by staying without a little bit of carbohydrates for the next 24, 48 hours. So always just go slowly. And if you're right, if you have to, Back off you can and make sure that the potassium, phosphate, and magnesium is corrected uh, before you start upping the rate. So we might start with TPN in a high-risk patient at 12 mils an hour for 24 hours. Then we will do the next day, we'll do the electrolytes. And if those are all normal and replaced, we will then double it maybe. And we always do this with a multidisciplinary team. We have a dedicated um, uh, a dietitian, because as doctors, we're very poor managing people's nutrition. And even though I see a lot of these patients, I can't tell you what milligram per kilogram or of day of calorie, calories a patient needs. I leave that up to the, the dietitian. So a multidisciplinary team is crucial if you're treating these patients. But if you're in a general medical ward, then just do the basics. You start with it slowly and you build up and you just repeat the electrolytes every day before and correct them. Um, and then the last thing is that if you're worried, these patients must go into an ICU or high care environment. Even if you do not at your hospital have ICUs or high care that accept patients, I think it's your duty to at least refer them and have the team say, sorry, this is not the patient that we can put into ICU. Our demand is too high because patients die rapidly once they have a refeeding. And by and large, the patients who are gonna die are those patients, as you mentioned, who are very high risk. And those patients who are edematous already, those patients who have profound immune, um, uh, malnutrition with very low BMIs. You know, the patient with a, uh, a magnesium that's a bit low and a phosphate's a bit low, those kind of patients you can be, you, you just monitor them. And just to say that, Oral supplementation is very poor um, in these patients, especially if they're quite advanced because they've got edema of their bowels as well. And both potassium and magnesium is actually poorly absorbed orally. Often patients who get magnesium orally get diarrhea. So we, in general, I would prefer that you do intravenous correction of the phosphate, magnesium, and potassium. And then as the patient goes out, you uh, you can then perhaps try some some oral uh, just to just to fix, just to say that people say that the the high risk is within the first forty eight to seventy two hours but that's not always the case patients can go out ten days we're still replacing magnesium and phosphate 
10 days out in patients. So just because the 72 hours has passed does not mean that, okay, now we can relax and not worry and do the electrolytes every week. I think those are just some of the points I wanted to highlight from your presentation. And we can have some questions if anyone's got some questions. I'm just going to go to the chat. What is the comment? The comment you must say, what is the commonest cause of death in this group of patients? I mean, I would think arrhythmias. We've also seen patients who are become hypothermic, actually. And basically, they get delirious, hypothermic, and then you try and resuscitate them and they died. I, I don't know from your reading if it's, if it's the, the rhythm problems. Mostly, like, they die from cardiac complications. Yeah. Everything else is the most common yeah. cause of death. Yeah. So often you'll leave work and you'll come back and the patient needed to be resuscitated through the night and they've, they've died. And, you know, that's how it is. Anyone else with questions? Okay. Can you can you see the questions, Dr. Omar? Uh, I can see them, yeah. Yeah, do you want to... Can we use... I mean... I mean, I don't know the answer to that, but I think that I wouldn't, there's no reason to do that. I think the measures that you have in place, which is very, very slow carbohydrate introduction of feed with correcting, pre-correcting all the electrolytes and keeping an eye on things in an ICU environment mitigates the risk of an arrhythmia. I'm not sure that giving antiarrhythmic agents makes sense to me but I haven't read anything about that. So I don't know if you want to, if you have any suggestions. I haven't seen also in the literature that they mm. don't recommend using antiretinous. Yeah. I don't think ob obesity doesn't cause refeeding syndrome. The point that Dr. Omar was making that patients who are obese, if you're 135 kilos, but you've lost 50 kilos during whatever illness you've had, you've lost an enormous amount of your body mass. So the point he's making is just because you fat doesn't mean you can't refeed. Also, there are some patients who use, I don't know how to put it, like they want to lose weight very fast. Yes. They do it outside. So these patients also can develop refeeding syndrome. When they starve themselves, they don't eat. And then they end up they usually uh, in the emergency department presenting with okay. everything is those things. Yeah. I haven't seen that, but uh, just remember that it's the carbohydrates that cause this problem. You know, proteins are still fine. And and if you put up a drip on someone with dextrosaline or dextrose water, those are the patients who are at risk when they be, have prolonged malnutrition. Because we often just put up a drip and say, I don't know, dextrosaline is our kind of go-to or GMS or whatever. And if there's any glucose in there that's going to cause problems so just be aware of that in those patients who are very severely malnourished i see dominique has come up with his usual difficult question let's have a look so evoke hyperosmolar non-ketotic coma or ketoacidosis metabolic acidosis and remember it resemble a dka uh, <laughs> do you want to take this on <laughs> you see dka patients are dehydrated, but these patients with refeeding syndrome have fluid overload. So it's, uh, they can have coma, but it doesn't resemble, I think, DK picture. Yeah, I mean, they can become acidotic, I imagine, but yes. that would be on the basis of a circulatory problem, I would imagine, rather than on, you know, what the, the, the ketotic or what, you know, situation. Um, I just think you need to keep it simple. And even the simple measures, like just measuring and replacing potassium, magnesium, phosphate, and not putting up a drip at 125 mils an hour of dextrosaline is often lost on people managing these patients or anorexics, for example. 
So, so I think you just need to keep it simple before trying to think about all the potential kind of problems and then just put them in a high care area. You know, just make sure they're monitored, put them on an ECG monitor. Okay. Nasif has his hand up, he can, he wants to make Okay. Uh, okay, Nasif. Um, hi, good evening. Uh, thanks for the wonderful presentation. Um, Dion, I have sort of two questions. Um, the first question relates to the mode of feeding. So whether it's yes. TPN versus intro yes. oral feeding, is the risk of refeeding sort of different with the different modes? It's like, is it higher with TPN versus enteral feeding? Um, that's my first question. Perhaps that one first. My understanding is that refeeding is refeeding, whether you go with enteral or parenteral. Obviously, in a patient who has an absorption problem and you go with enteral feed, perhaps it may not affect them as much as the IV. But I think the message is that refeeding syndrome is because you've reintroduced a carbohydrate load in patients who have not had the carbohydrate load for many days and who have a low BMI. And that sets off the whole insulin, hyperinsulin secretion and all the problems you have. I think, I, I don't know, I haven't done enough reading to know specifically and intuitively you would want to say that parental feeding would be worse, but I don't think that's the message. And, and it's, it's not, and it shouldn't be the message that, oh, you know, just give them some a nasogastric feed and we can mitigate against refeeding. If you can absorb the carbohydrate, you will have refeeding. I don't know if that answers your question or Dr. Omar, if you yeah. want to add. Uh, thanks, Dion. Uh, that okay. was sort of mine. Thanks. I, I, I agree with you. I mean, the TPN intuitively felt like a high risk, but as you said, it's just the reintroduction of, of calories. Um, Correct. My second question was just that, an observation that sort of in my previous job that we actually had discussed it, we see many people that are many patients that are chronically malnourished. And yeah, I'm talking of patients with HIV, TB, they're malnourished for a very, very long time. And it's just possible that we just didn't get to miss it and diagnose it. But we always felt that um, when these patients were started on ARVs and being fed, there was a lower incidence of, of refeeding amongst those, that category of patients. So the question really is, uh, amongst people that are that, that are malnourished for a long period of time, where there's some degree of you know the body's trying to adapt, um, is refeeding when you soft is that is it low in, in that context of patients, where where they become malnourished over a much longer time than, or is that is that is that is that probably not not correct? Are you asking me if it's a slow burn rather than a fast burn that the slow burn yes. patients will not be affected as much? Yeah, that's great, Dion. Yeah, I'm not sure I can answer that directly because it's often I often think about the fact that we see a lot of malnourished patients on the medical wards, and uh, and the problem is that you don't know which one of those is going to have a refeeding. So if somebody looks like they're malnourished, I would think you just need to make sure that you've measured their potassium, magnesium, and phosphate, and just have an index, a uh, high index of suspicion, and that and that you just monitor that without kind of monitoring every single patient. I mean, we are talk talking about high-risk patients with very low BMIs who've had prolonged malnutrition. So I suppose in answering your question, it could happen to any of these patients. Uh, it's just that there's so many other problems that we have to deal with that we often just, we often just like kind of let it pass. And the truth is we probably get away with it most of the time. In fact, you know, many patients don't die from, from refeeding. I, I, I don't know if I can answer that better than I don't have enough data. Thank, thanks, Dion. Okay. Any role for trace element supplementation or loading doses of trace elements, zinc, selenium, magnesium? Um, Look, as, as Dr. Omar pointed out, there are micronutrients that are going to be depleted, but having a low zinc is unlikely to kill you, um, as far as I understand, or a low selenium. So as a package with everything going wrong, your low micronutrients, your low potassium, your low phosphate, I suppose it's, 
an additive thing. But I don't think, again, you want to be complicating things with measuring zinc and selenium, although you can measure zinc. And in many patients, we do add zinc if they're in an IF unit. But we're talking about a patient that's coming in and you're worried about the refreeding syndrome in the first sort of 72 hour period. And so, and so I would say that just stick to the things that count. You want to prevent a cardiac arrhythmia by making sure that the potassium, magnesium, and phosphate are replaced and monitored and slow down your carbohydrate uh, nutrition if you need to. Um, the insulin starts going up, therefore acidosis should decline uh, as well as potassium. In refeeding syndrome, the insulin starts going up, therefore acidosis should decline as well as the potassium. Okay, fair enough. That would make it, that was Nones just mentioned that. That would make sense, I suppose, because we give insulin to acidotic patients who hyper hyperglycemic. Yeah, I, I suppose, yeah. Anything else? No one? So can we stop? If you're done for the evening, of course you yeah, can. Yeah, it seems that way. <laughs> okay, I think we'll stop now. Thanks, Dr. Omar. That was an excellent... Uh, presentation i think it covered i covered it, it covered the whole sort of refeeding syndrome and and just keep it simple because what happens when you start worrying about all sorts of other things like ketoacidosis and what's happening to the selenium i'm not saying that's not an issue you forget the basics and i think that's the important message here okay so I just want to thank Dr. Omar. I want to thank the ECHO um, project of University of New Mexico and the, the various teams that support this. And then uh, to thanks to the Gastro Foundation. And just to say, I think this will be on the site. And then the next meeting is going to be Monday week. So it's the 19th of August, correct? At six o'clock. It's celiac disease, food allergies and intolerances. I think that's quite a big topic to undertake and probably suggest that you just deal with celiac disease. Um, but it's up to whoever's presenting. I think it's uh, Dr. McCann and Dr. Sabilo is going to be the moderator. So thanks very much, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Oh, sorry, there's more here. A chat, is that just a... Ah, okay. Just thanking us for an excellent... Thank you for an excellent talk. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thanks. Is Donnie wanting to say something or is that just a goodbye? Um, I think it's a goodbye. Let me just check. And just thank you very much. Excellent talk. Now I can see I can see Nonnie on the screen waving his hand. That's what I was wondering. Bye -bye. Oh, I, I can't see him. So I don't know. I hope he's oh there he is. Hi, Nonnie. How's it? Uh, bye, hi, hi, yes. Bye. Good. That's excellent. Thank you. Oh, okay. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Bye. See you next time.